We Need Each Other is a podcast about the importance of human interaction. It provides a reminder that we are not intended to live in isolation. Human beings need each other. The things about another that piss you off and the things that take you over the moon are all opportunities to see through another's eyes, recognize their intrinsic value, and look more deeply within ourselves to find the love that's always there. I'm so excited to have this guest today. We have such many wonderful guests on this show that agree to say yes, because we do need each other. And this man that we have today has a wealth of information that we need to know and understand his perspective and just champion him for the work that he's doing in the world. So let me introduce to you Eric J. Miller. He is a professor and Leo J. O'Brien Fellow at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles, California, where he teaches and writes in the areas of criminal procedure, jurisprudence, critical race theory, reparations, and problem-solving courts. Professor Miller is a former chair of the AALS section on criminal justice and a co-editor of the Cambridge Handbook, Handbook on Policing in America, 2019, as well as co-founder of the Policing Los Angeles Forum, which brings legal academics, law enforcement, personnel, lawyers, policymakers, and activists together to propose innovative policing reforms. Yay! (laughs) His scholarship focuses the intersection of criminal justice with political theory, sociology, and criminology. Professor Miller is an internationally recognized expert on problem-solving justice and specialty courts, as well as on the police and policing and on reparations for African Americans. He has provided testimony to the United States Congress, House Judiciary Committee, the United States Sentencing Commission, the Federal Judicial Center's National Workshop for U.S. Magistrate Judges, the Eighth Circuit Chief Judges Conference, and internationally to the Scottish Commission on Women Offenders and the Scottish Government Judicial Studies committee. There is just so much more that I could say about this amazing man. Look him up and and learn more because we have a lot of talking to do because he has such a wealth of information. Welcome to this episode, Eric. Thanks so much. I'm so happy to have you with us. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. (laughs) Um, it, it came to be, besides all this other information that Eric has that we will talk about today, but a, a couple of months ago, we had an episode with two members of the Black Law Student Association, Nikki and Beatrice from Loyola Law School, and they talked about some demands that they had made of the university and a recognition that there were some racial issues at the school in a great deal in what was not being taught in the classroom. You know, I think it was Nikki said that she took uh, criminal justice and how can you teach a criminal justice class and not talk about race and race was just never spoken. Or if it was brought up, it was kind of on the surface and nothing ever went deep. And they're wanting to see in this particular time that we're living in uh, a, a deeper resolution to the world that we are living in, which in my humble opinion, and Eric, you can help me with this, I believe that law professors are just extremely important right now because they are shaping young man, young minds. They're teaching them about what is really true as they go into these different areas of law and to see what they're really looking at because we have lived in a system that has been through a particular gaze and has looked at criminals as looking in a certain way, which is you know, just not the makeup of every person. So that's my opinion. I have nothing to do with law. I'm not in a, 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 I'm not a professor of any sort. I'm not in the law school, but it's just my, just the thought that's come to me. So I'm just curious what your take on that is, Eric. Isn't it an important place to be a professor in a law school right now? Yeah, I think, um, I think being a professor is, uh, a great and important place to be uh, at any time because you get, as you point out, to to shape young minds. Um, but especially now, uh, following the the 
murder of George Floyd and then the political uprising. Um, and, you know, nationwide, I think, universities and law schools, in part prompted by students like um, Nikki and Beatrice and the other uh, Black Law Student Association members at, uh, at places like uh, Loyola Law School, um, all of us are, are being uh, challenged to uh, rethink the way we teach and what we teach. Um, and uh, Nikki and Beatrice, on behalf of BALSA, uh, made a, a set of demands uh, of Loyola Law School. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we are beginning the process of addressing it. I, I think... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, one of the points that you raised, uh, you know, thinking about the criminal process uh, is an important one. So there's been some uh, scholarship recently. Uh, a friend of mine, Alice Ristroff at Brooklyn Law School, uh, just wrote a really fantastic article in the Columbia uh, Law Review, uh, suggesting that the way that we teach criminal law, which is a mandatory uh, first year class for all law students. It's tested on the bar exam uh, in every bar in the country. Uh, and so it's really an introductory course for students to get uh, sort of their first exposure to to the law. Um, one of the ways that we uh, teach that course is to focus primarily on violent crime. And as Alice points out, that gives a perception that all criminals mm -hmm. are uh, people engaged in in violent acts. They're, you might think of them as moral monsters who need to be locked uh, away. And so when we think of the statistic, if we, if we do, I mean, not every case book uh, includes a discussion of the practice of punishment, but if we think of the fact that there's 2.3 million people in uh, federal and state prison, um, that... Uh, 50% of those people are African-American, uh, that uh, they're overwhelmingly uh, uh, black men, although the fastest growing group in uh, prison is black women, um, that uh, when they are uh, f first have their contact with the criminal justice system, they tend to be young, so uh, between the ages of 15 and 25, um, uh, that this is a, uh, has a massive impact on the uh, black community, so um, uh, something like one in four people between the ages of 15 and 25 in certain states are uh, have contact with the criminal uh, justice system, or the criminal process, as I prefer to call it. Um, that's an amazing uh, feature of the criminal law, uh, but it's not something that tends to be discussed in criminal law courses. Mm. And, mm. and so that gets to your point, when we, when we see that 50% of people in uh, jails uh, and prison are African-American, um, if you follow along with the first-year criminal course, you're going to think, well, they're moral monsters who deserve to be there. And you may even think, thank goodness they're there uh, mm -hmm. for, for my mm -hmm. safety. Um, but it turns out that uh, the criminal law casebook um, radically misrepresents the people who have contact with the criminal justice system. So... Um, so one of the things I'm currently involved in is uh, writing a case book with um, uh, two other people, Roger Fairfax and Bennett Capers. Uh, and that's going to be the um, first major case book in criminal law, at least as far as we're aware, uh, by three black men. I'm black British, they're African American. And one of the things that we really wanted to do with the case book is um, think hard about uh, including... Um, alternative crimes, so crimes against property uh, has a significant mm -hmm. impact. Victimless crime uh, has a significant uh, um, portion of the case book. Things like, uh, so victimless crimes include things like gambling, sex work, um, uh, drug possession. Uh, but in the property law context, uh, we've included a couple of cases that really, I think, hammer home um, how uh, the criminal justice system often doesn't 
protect the weak and vulnerable, but actually targets the weak and vulnerable. Um, so one of the cases, it's a California case, features, uh, I think it's a six-year-old child who, um, certainly it's a, 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 an elementary school child, who um, has uh, got hold of their teacher's visor. And uh, the case illustrates um, the law of theft and a particular part of the law of theft, two parts of the law of theft. One is that in order to steal something, you have to not only take it from someone, but you have to take it away from someone. So you have to move it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second is there's a, a what's called a mental element. So you have to intend not to give it back. And in this case, the six-year-old, uh, just in having the visor on their desk and moving it around their desk satisfies, according to the court, the movement um, element. And then uh, the child is seen uh, potentially with the visor in the hallway and uh, can't find it, so uh, loses it. And losing it, the court says, uh, demonstrates an intent not to return, um, uh, which is another element of the crime of theft. And so what's striking to me is why would the teacher call the police? And mm -hmm. why would the prosecutor mm -hmm. uh, decide to prosecute? A six -year -old. So this is a decision by a prosecutor. Yeah, by a prosecutor to, to prosecute someone. You know, even if it's a 26-year-old, it, it is an elementary school child, um, for, the, for the theft of a $6 visor. Um, and uh, so when we talk about the school-to-prison pipeline, um, that's it directly there. Uh, it's real. Another, oh, it's totally real. Mm -hmm. And then another case we, we in, uh, included um, is an arson case. So arson is a destruction of property by fire. Uh, property in the criminal law has to be a thing of value. Well, in this case, uh, another school kid sets a fire in a trash can in a schoolyard, not something uh, you, you want to encourage children to do, mm -hmm. um, but... The major question in the case was whether the child destroyed any, any property, anything of value. It is, after all, trash in a trash can. The court says yes. And again, a teacher decides to call the police and a prosecutor decides to prosecute the child. And a judge decides that this child deserves um, to go into the um, juvenile justice process um, for an act that if it occurred... Uh, in uh, someone's backyard would, would probably uh, just get uh, a wagging of the finger. So these are not moral monsters mm -hmm. that are going uh, to our uh, prisons and jails and into our um, uh, juvenile detention centres. Uh, these are kids playing with visors and playing with matches. Um, and sometimes playing with matches is dangerous, but sometimes um, it's not. And so... Uh, what we want the casebook to do in part is um, get the students to question uh, who we're using the criminal law against um, mm -hmm. and whether uh, the victims really are, whether there are victims here. Who's the victim here? The teacher losing a $6 visor, um, the school having to clean up the, the mess in the trash can. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, whether it's actually the weak and the vulnerable that are being targeted by the criminal law system, in this case, uh, two school kids. So explain to me and the listeners exactly how is a case study book used? So, um, so a case book is uh, a collection of cases used to illustrate um, the elements of uh, particular laws. So each law, so, so if you think of, uh, for example, I want to teach you the law of theft. Uh, the law of theft requires, so the definition of theft is um, the taking and carrying away of some uh, thing of value with the intent to permanently deprive the owner of their property. So we've got the elements of taking, uh, of carrying away, um, which are acts, physical acts, and then a mental element, which is the intent to uh, permanently deprive. And so what will, so, so I can just tell you that's the statute, but um, what we do with casebooks is we use the casebook to go through uh, normally one or two examples um, 
of each of the elements, so the elements of taking, of carrying away, and of uh, permanently depriving, and getting the students to think a little bit um, about uh, what these things mean, like um, uh, how much movement does there need to be a carrying away? The answer in this case is not much at all. It just needs to move it around uh, mm -hmm. um, the desk. Um, what sort of intent is the intent to permanently deprive? So, so normally it would be, um, you know, me um, uh, taking your wallet or purse um, in order to keep it for myself. Well, this child lost it. Is that really an intent to permanently deprive? The court in the, in the first case we discussed uh, says yes. And so, um, so what the cases in a case book uh, push us to do is hopefully um, think about not just the core cases, but also the boundaries uh, of various laws and how we're going to apply them uh, and against whom we're going to apply them. And where all the cases if we're thinking about um, theft, are things like um, uh, someone uh, uh, snatching a purse uh, in the middle of a street, that seems like quite a, a um, if not totally violent, although it could be violent, certainly very disturbing and shocking act. Mm -hmm. Like it offends our sense of um, safety. Uh, a child... Uh, taking a visor and losing it mm. uh, doesn't seem to fit with that. And so if all the cases that we learn about are cases in which uh, someone does something aggressive or violent um, or, or something that uh, clearly um, shocks our moral sensibility, then we're going to think that um, everyone who's in jail or prison has done something mm -hmm. that is shocking or violent. Um, and so they certainly deserve to be there. Um, what we're trying to do is select cases that challenge the idea that they deserve to be there, in part so that we can then um, uh, better serve the students, uh, in, you know, all students who need to think about what the purpose of the criminal law is, um, but also uh, particularly uh, the students who this summer said we want a curriculum that's responsive to the issues of social justice mm -hmm. uh, that structure our society. And so what we want to help do is, is um, show some of the ways that the criminal justice system, and depending on your view, you're going to think it fails or it um, succeeds in deliberately targeting um, uh, historically discriminated against people or uh, people on the margins of society. So we have some cases that discuss, for example, um, uh, people with mental uh, disabilities uh, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, uh, the way that the criminal justice system uh, targets uh, transgender people is is included in the case book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, so what what we wanted to do was respond to the demand that uh, people are making nationally, but, but Nikki and Beatrice made on our campus mm -hmm. to um, engage with systemic inequality. And I think this case book um, does that. But even if you don't have a case book um, that is geared around that, there's plenty of cases uh, in the first year case book that, um, have facts that we often jump over. And that was one of, I think, the mm. students' complaints. Mm. We jump over the facts that pertain to race or to gender or to class or to disability or to national origin and say that uh, they're irrelevant to thinking like a lawyer. Uh, whereas um, I think we at Loyola, and hopefully um, you know, this is just good legal practice, uh, need to see the whole person uh, when we're thinking about mm. how we represent uh, clients or represent uh, the state when um, uh, prosecuting or defending clients, uh, and recognize that you know justice is more is about more than simply following the letter of the law, but making sure that the law is used in ways that produce good outcomes. How do you benefit a student who loses a visor by criminally prosecuting mm -hmm. them and having them go into the juvenile system? You you know it just seems crazy to me. So this, so as a professor, your case book 
when it is ready, will be available to me mm-hmm. to use as examples of cases in my classroom. Correct. Right? But it's my choice whether or not I want to use it. Or is yeah, it required uh, or would it be a requirement in the school that this is the case buddy case book that we're gonna use for these particular classes at this school? How does that work? Is it no, my individual no, choice? Um, yeah, as a law professor, so this is one of the interesting features of the American legal system, uh, which is different. So, so I'm Scottish. I, I study law in Scotland and in, in the States. And in, in Scotland, basically, um, uh, uh, there's a, certainly a smaller choice of, of textbooks. And mm. the sense I got was that the... Um, there was a designated person on the faculty to teach property, to teach um, criminal law, and so on and so forth. So, so there was the standard book that everybody uses is is a feature of of the Scottish and English legal system. But um, in the American system, uh, there's uh, much more choice, and so the selection of a case book is, for the most part, a personal decision by um, the professor, and the professor can even not choose a case book and, and come up with their own materials. For me, the advantage of having a case book, um, even though they are uh, ridiculously expensive, so it's a bit of a burden on, this, on, on the students, certainly, is that the advantage of having a bound set of materials is that the student um, treats that as authoritative. So mm-hmm. because they spend a lot of money Mm-hmm. on a book that's put out by the legal casebook industry, mm-hmm. they think, oh, this is, and it has been, you know, the scholars look at it and they, they give you feedback on the casebook and um, uh, they say whether they would use it themselves and so on and so forth. So it's, it's not like there's no vetting, but, but um, the students, I think, t- treat the casebook with a little bit more uh, reverence than necessarily they should. Um, and so for us, I think it was important uh, to produce a case book uh, in order to um, intervene in the, this space. Now, there are other um, case books written from a, a sort of um, more liberal perspective, um, but I think ours is really pushing hard in the direction of selecting a lot of the case books cover the same cases they just cover it from different perspectives i think um you know we include some of the uh, some of the standard cases um, but uh, we include a lot more and so we give the professor a lot more choice in what they want to teach um uh, and hopefully uh bring a perspective that will enable people who want to um, keep pushing forward uh, through this moment um, the opportunity to do so using these materials in their class. But we can't mandate that um, Mm -hmm. everyone in Loyola teaches from the casebook. I mean, I can go around and knock on their doors. Right. But as you say, as you said, people who want to. So then the question behind all of that is, how do you change the mindset of the people who've been teaching this class in this way every day? And I've used this case book and these are the kinds of things that I do. And uh, I don't really even see that whole world you're talking about. And I'm not focusing on it. how do you change? How do you open their minds? How do you change that mindset? Because that's a requirement. So, yeah. So one of the ways that we've done it at Loyola is by, um, introducing a learning outcome. And as I think uh, Nikki and Beatrice explained, the, the um, American Bar Association, which, which um, essentially regulates the standards at uh, various law schools, has recently required law schools to come out with a set of learning outcomes. And then will every, I think it's four years or five years, goes to the law school and asks them to demonstrate that they have Mm -hmm. um, evaluated whether the students have learned what we've said they ought to learn. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that's been going on across the country 
um, leading up to uh, you know, coming back on campus has been a rethinking of the syllabus and um, what students are offered, in part because students have demanded uh, to be taught about race and class and gender and social justice. And uh, one way that a lot of law schools, um, not necessarily all of them, but a, a sizable chunk have responded to this is by saying, what we're going to do is we're going to have a class on um, race and the law and we're going to make it mandatory so everybody has to take it. Of course, the worry is that if you just have one class singled out to discuss race and the law um, and everybody has to take it, the students are going to think, well, um, that's two or three credits that I could be using to study tax law that I'm having mm -hmm. to study this. And I really am uninterested in that. So it generates um, some... Uh, um, uh, you know, pushback from from students who aren't particularly focused on on, for example, a course on race. Um, and in order to make it mandatory, um, unless you're going to hire a bunch of new professors, so every student has to take the class to graduate. Um, if if it's a small class, you know, a ten to fifteen person class. Um, and you've got a hundred people in the in the year, then you know you need um, you know eight to ten professors to teach that class. So the default is to have one one hundred person class with one teacher, which means that you don't cover the materials particularly well, and you have a bunch of students who don't want to be there. And so we didn't think that was a way to go. And so the learning outcome. Uh, that we adopted, which is um, uh, that students will understand law's uh, impact on systemic inequality, uh, we made uh, mandatory for the first year classes uh, and the required upper division classes, the so second and third year classes. Uh, and those second and third year classes are evidence law, um, constitutional law, and uh, the legal profession class, which is about essentially legal morality, the, the morality mm -hmm. of, of lawyers in taking cases. And so I teach evidence. So, so the evidence professors had a, had a meeting uh, to discuss how we were going to do this. And, um, you know, some people are keener than others on um, changing their curriculum. Um, certainly um, all of us, professors feel like we're trying to squeeze as much as we can and so a choice to include something is inevitably a choice to drop something else from the from the course um, but a lot of it is um, ensuring that uh, what we're teaching is really the the practice of law so yeah. it actually enables us, because what we're talking about is law's impact on systemic inequality. So we're asking, what's society like? Who has power? Who doesn't have power? And how does the law uh, help or, or hinder that? And so with a criminal law course, in the case beat, you can see that what we want to do is, is change the discussion from um, showing simply how the criminal law helps uh, lock up moral monsters, yay criminal law, to thinking about well, does the criminal law always target only those people? Um, no, it also targets the weak and vulnerable. And so now we have to have a more complicated conversation. The other thing about the learning outcome is, um, which I think is actually in some ways the most powerful part of the learning outcome, is, as I like to say, if uh, Justice Scalia rose from the dead and came back to teach at Loyola Law School, or, or Chief Justice Roberts decided to retire and came to teach at Loyola Law School. And the question is, would they be able to teach to the learning outcome? In other words, is the learning outcome inherently um, uh, progressive? And the answer is, well, it's somewhat progressive in the subject matter because we want the professors to focus on how the law impacts people in their lives. Um, but uh, just, as, just as Scalia famously wrote uh, uh, um, the opinion in a case called um, Croson versus City of Richmond, it's it's a case that actually is somewhat relevant now because it was whether the um, City of Richmond in Virginia 
could have a uh, set aside so that um, whatever it was, 10% of municipal contracts went to contractors who were uh, run by or predominantly African American or other people of color. And so, you know, with President Biden making mandatory the vaccine, these sorts of mandatory set-asides or, or mandatory orders by by governments uh, are back in the news. And um, uh, Justice Scalia essentially uh, says something like, uh, this is terrible because of the impact it will have on society. Mm -hmm. uh, the city of Richmond is a majority uh, black um, city. And so uh, the worry is that if black people get in power, they'll do... Um, the same things that white people did and so racially discriminate. And and so, you know, you may or may not agree with that, but at least he's having a discussion of the yeah. law's impact on uh, society. And so what I like about the learning outcome is whatever perspective you teach it from, the one thing you can't do is ignore it. Mm. If you ignore it, the student has the right because it's a mandatory learning outcome, to call you out as a professor mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. And so the learning outcome empowers the students to raise the issues in the class. They're no longer taught that it's not thinking like a lawyer to think about race and class and gender and disability and, and, um, and all these things, national origin. Uh, instead, these are things that the law has an impact on and we have an obligation as law professors to address. Now, um, uh, if you're... A liberal, you're going to address it from a liberal perspective. Um, but if you're a conservative, uh, you can't just ignore it. Um, and the dirty secret is that conservatives don't just ignore it. Uh, often they, like Justice Scalia in Croson versus Ri City of Richmond, um, come up with their own version of uh, law's impact on society, uh, one that, you know, you and I may disagree with, but other, other people may agree with. And so I, I think having an inclusive classroom uh, means that um, we get to engage with all perspectives, conservative, liberal, in the middle, undecided, uninterested, mm -hmm. um, and ideally empower students to have a voice in that process. And that's what I'm hoping uh, mm -hmm. that this does. Now, the big difficulty then is, is how we change our teaching style um, which in law schools has historically been one in which the professor dominates the students um, to deal with this new zone of uh, student empowerment. And I think that is where things are likely to be um, difficult, where even you know, well-meaning professors are going to struggle with their new role in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I I just pray that all of that goes really well because it's uh, and and your casebook sounds wonderful. So on all of that, and um, you know, I'm. Well, I mean, gonna, I think I, I'm going to want to stay posted on on what's happening and how it's going because I do. I really it's something I really care about. It's something I really care about having nothing to do no connection with it i really care about it go ahead you were going to say something. well but i think it speaks yeah i think it speaks to a bigger problem in society so there's two ways of doing i mean there's a lot of ways of doing um the work of becoming more inclusive um one way though is is to change the syllabus mm -hmm. or um you know in different workplaces it's to um change how we address each other in a museum, it may be to bring out some exhibits and put other exhibits away. I, I find um, museum Twitter to be quite an interesting place at the mm, moment mm, uh, where people mm. are discussing how, how, how to deal with this. Um, so, I mean, you can think of a whole bunch of superficial ways of doing it. If, if you're in a law firm, what you do is you... Um, uh, set up uh, an equity and inclusion committee and make sure that your brochures include um, people of color. That standard way that we're all familiar with of uh, sort of um, riding out the storm. Um, for us, having empowered the students, uh, the challenge then becomes doing the hard work of learning 
how to teach differently. So it's not just writing a different curriculum. It's, it's about interacting in ways that genuinely respect the people with whom we're um, learning with and teaching to. And I think that's something that isn't just limited to law schools, but that that yeah. um, speaks to this this moment. And so, um, uh, l- learning empathy and respect, um, recognizing who needs to do the work to change. So that's not the hard our part. students, that's the hard part. right? So you know, I, I don't want um, our students to bear the uh, brunt of um, uh, badly thought out pedagogy in which Mm. all you do when you want to address an issue you perceive as a black issue or an issue you perceive as a woman's issue or an issue you perceive as a a prosecutor's issue, Mm. that you call on a black person, a woman, or someone you perceive as conservative. That's not the way... Uh, that it should go. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, all too often it it is the way that it goes. And so, so the real question I think for for uh, Loyola um, is how uh, well we as a faculty are going to do in uh, as it were reteaching ourselves. Um, and I think that that's a real, really important and powerful question uh, that goes um, beyond the the law school but it's but even just located in the law school it's a really powerful and important question and you know some people are uh, better placed than others to embrace new stuff Um, you know some people have sunk a lot of time and effort into their materials and into their teaching Mm -hmm. style Mm -hmm. Uh, it can be difficult to change some people may not be motivated to change they may think that everything's hunky-dory and and um why uh should they do anything um different and uh those are difficult conversations and they're conversations that need to uh keep going but you know i'm i i'm optimistic uh that we're having these conversations. I, I know that you, uh, I think uh, you spoke to Kathleen uh, Kim mm-hmm. a while yeah. ago. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think she's really been supportive of the students, but is being supportive of the faculty as well. Mm-hmm. Um, there's certainly lots more work that needs to be done. Um, and uh, there's been some, you know, um, fairly good, sometimes passionate discussion about how we're going to do this um but again you know i i um i i think the mission of loyola law school is a social justice mission it's right there in our mission statement and so including an expansive inclusive understanding of social justice within that mission is really important and I'm grateful to our students for pushing us to do that. Yes, yes, I, I, I am too. You know, while I have you here, Eric, in a nutshell, <laughs> what's your take on reparations? Ha uh-huh. <laughs> ha. That's a whole well, other episode. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, um, so just so you know, um, I have a fairly long history with reparations. So in uh, 2002, 2003, I was a um, fellow at Harvard Law School uh, when uh, Charles Ogletree was tasked by Randall Robinson with coming up with a reparations lawsuit. Um, and uh, I'd been... Professor Ogletree's um, research assistant uh, before, and then I'd gone and um, clerked for a couple of judges, worked in a law firm when I was back, doing a fellowship trying to become a law professor, and I uh, needed some cash. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, so he said, well, look, I need a research assistant. Why don't you go and, and um, 
come and work uh, with us uh, on the Reparations Coordinating uh, Committee, uh, which uh, was him and uh, uh, another great lawyer, Ajwa Ayatoro, who's now uh, who's with uh, in Cobra and is now an emeritus law professor at the University of Arkansas. Anyway, Ogletree and Ayatoro were uh, trying to come up with a lawsuit and um, Ogletree went out to Tulsa, Oklahoma to give a talk and came back telling us that there were uh, 40 survivors of the Tulsa race massacre still alive um, and who were who wanted legal representation. And um, it turned out that there were 125 that we found uh, still alive. Uh, and uh, we filed a federal lawsuit on behalf of them. Uh, we had uh, Johnny Cochran uh, join the lawsuit, um, uh, a bunch of other uh, fantastic uh, lawyers uh, participating as well. And um, and so that's when I got involved. I, I uh, worked on that lawsuit. I helped draft the complaint um, uh, with uh, a few other people, Adjua, um, uh being one of them. And um, Suzette Malvo, who's now at Colorado University, being another. Uh, Al Brophy was a sort of an expert on the Tulsa race massacre. Uh, uh, was a sort of his legal historian who was advising us. Um, and so we filed the lawsuit. Uh, it went to federal court. It got um, uh, dismissed, which means that the court uh, denied the claims. Um, but it was a big moment, I think, for reparations. So, so I worked on that lawsuit, and now I'm back in court, state court this time, again representing the um, last three living survivors of the Tulsa race massacre, um, and this time we're alleging uh, public nuisance. So, so this is just giving a little bit of my background with reparations. Um, so what I think reparations are is uh, reparations... Uh, uh, are a um, remedy, transformative justice remedy uh, for a, a group-based intergenerational wrong. So the basic idea is some group, uh, and in particular I've focused on uh, African Americans, uh, has um, been targeted by some uh, person or entity uh, for uh, uh, an injury, so slavery, Jim Crow, that has an intergenerational effect. Um, and thinking about it this way has a few um, advantages. Uh, first of all, um, by focusing on uh, group-based oppression, essentially, uh, we can get past the idea that... Uh, the people to whom the harm was done have died, or the people who did the harm have died. Because the harm is to the group, and the group can continue over time. You know, just think of a, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, um, um, the Los Angeles Rams are not the same team from the 1950s. It's a whole different set of people. But it's, this, it's, the, it's the same, you know, it's, it's still the Los Angeles Rams. Yeah. It's just a different uh, set of individuals that are are the are the Rams. So that's the that's one thing that I think helps is is you can see how it's the same. You know, the group is targeted as a group, even though different individuals come in and out of that uh, group. The second thing I, I think that reparations is about is um, the remedy is so so what reparations is is to uh, empower. Uh, the victims of intergenerational group-based oppression to determine from, for themselves how things are going to go for them in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds a little bit wishy-washy, um, but it... So, am I in favour of uh, payments to individuals as a form of reparations? Sure. Um, I think one version of reparations is definitely uh, you harmed me, uh, so you owe me... Uh, you, know, you, you took my money and my land, so you need to give me back my money and my land. So um, uh, we've seen that happening um, in Los Angeles just recently, uh, you know, where the city took uh, a beach property away from yeah. African Americans and yeah. is now giving it back. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, by focusing on uh, the idea of so if we think about slavery um, or if you think about Tulsa so think about uh, uh, the harm done in the Tulsa race massacre so one there are a group of people so we have three living uh, plaintiffs um, uh, uh, Leslie Randall, uh, Viola Fraser, and uh, Mr. Van Ellis, Hughes Van Ellis. Um, so they were victims of the race massacre. Their house was burned. Um, they were um, uh, terrorized. Their property was taken. The people who took that property, who burned those houses, which includes the city of Tulsa, the city of Tulsa police force, the city of Tulsa sheriff's department, ought to give that land back and ought to pay for their property. So that's direct monetary payments. But um, the the act of mass racial violence, burning the terror, burning down 35 eight, um, city blocks to the ground, uh, killing upwards of uh, 300 uh, people, um, uh, running 3,000 of uh, 3,000 people out of town, so turning them into refugees uh, who fled from the the city. The ones who stayed were kept in. Um, detention camps, uh, paroled uh, essentially into the custody of their employers, so it was like a form of slavery um, for a few days, uh, and then forced to live in Red Cross tents for the next six months. Um, you know, this is a mass act of, of terror, and its effects are still felt. And to the extent that um, uh, the white citizens of Tulsa are um, uh, uh, continue to um, use the um, system of racial oppression to keep themselves up and keep other people down these are new wrongs like it's it's not just the right. it's not just the people that burned the house down right. uh, that have done a bad act it's the current citizens who refuse to allow um, the uh, black survivors and their descendants uh, to re-empower themselves that continually harm uh, the, the people of Tulsa. And you can say the same about slavery and structural uh, uh, racism uh, more generally. So, so for me, reparations is a complicated thing because on the one hand, there's a historical wrong um, but the historical wrong also produces contemporary wrongs. And each of those wrongs deserves a remedy. And then the final question I think uh, I'm coming to see as quite profound is, um, so reparations um, often is associated historically with black nationalism. And you might think that one of the really important questions raised by black nationalism is uh, something like, how do you expect us to continue to go along with you, to live with you mm -hmm. in community? And, um, and I think that is a core question of, of the transformational justice aspect of reparations. The, the, um, the question is, um, given the harm that you've done in the past, and how you continue to harm us in the present. Um, what we need is a transformation, and who knows what that transformation is going to be. It may be one in which we continue to um, join together in a in an American, you know, a larger community. Uh, certainly, um, uh, the survivors of the Tulsa race massacre, when they testified in Congress, that was, you know, they said we're proud to be American. Um, and we believe in the American uh, project. But there's also this you know, other aspect of it that says, but um, you know, um, we can't guarantee uh, uh, that reconciliation is going to be the ultimate outcome. It depends on uh, how you treat us and how you support us. And I think that that's a really... Um, it's a difficult question. It's a question that you know different communities face in different ways um, all the time. But I think that that in some ways um, that is what 
is a question that reparations really uh, pressure, presses hard upon because it points out that um, uh, you know the, the the crude version is you owe us. The the slightly more sophisticated version, I think, is uh, you have to do something to show us that you respect us and that that we can go on together as a mutually um, uh, respectful equals in community together. Mm -hmm. And simply saying, um, you know, it happened a long time ago. Yeah. Tough luck. Yeah. Um, uh, it turns out it's actually quite disrespectful. And it denies community in important ways. And, um, uh, and so... So I think there's, I realize it's a very long answer to a very short question, but um, this is all my way of saying that reparations is uh, quite a complicated mm -hmm. um, business and uh, requires um, a lot of thought and activism if it's going to be done right. Eric, I just, I'm so grateful. I'm, I'm grateful that you exist. I'm grateful that you, this individual Eric Miller, I'm grateful that you exist because you're doing so much. You care about so much. You're processing so much that the world, not just this country, the world needs right now. You know, we, you're know, talking about we need each other. What you're bringing, what you're providing, what you're focused on and what you're bringing people together to assist in doing is beautiful. And what you're aligning with yourself and being brought into it's beautiful and it's necessary and it's so powerful and it gives me hope because, man, it's hard being a black person in the United States of America. It just is. You know, even if your life doesn't look difficult in comparison to what other people's lives look like, I don't care how happy and happy-go-lucky your life looks, you're still black in America. And it's, it's a perspective that it's really hard to understand if you don't live that life or even have an alignment with that life. So I'm grateful to you. I, 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 you know, I, I could do three more episodes with you, honestly, because you have so much. We didn't even get into police reform. Um, <laughs> next time, maybe. Um, yeah. I'm so grateful to you. I really appreciate your being here with us today and taking oh, your well. time. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you for this conversation. Yes, me too, very much so. We will speak with you again soon. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Eric. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. Bye. Bye.